and we are live. All right, welcome everyone to Science of Business podcast. Um, today we will be talking about creativity. Uh, I have a special guest uh, in here, John Besan, that has been working on this topic for years. And what's especially is, is super inspiring for me is that in how many books you appeared that relate to uh, creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship. As far as I remember, over 40, right? Yep. <laughs> so, <Like> so. <laughs> to warm up, uh, I wonder if you could tell me after so many years of playing with innovation, with creativity, like first of all, why, why, <laughs> why, why is still a, something interesting for you? But what is more important is like, how do you perceive it now? Like what is creativity for you after all these years? How do you understand it now? Wow. Well, thanks, Radit. It's great to have a chance to share some ideas with you. Um, yeah, nice small question to start with, bang. but uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess the the, the 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 simple answer is creativity is is everything. Um, quite simply, why is creativity important? Um, if we didn't have it, we wouldn't be around. As a species, as human beings, we're not very fast. We're not very big. Uh, if you go back in time, we just wouldn't have survived as a species without that ability to imagine. And imagination is a source of creativity, helps us to find new tools, helps us particularly in those days to interact socially and co-create something. So it's not just a solo thing, it's sharing. Um, so it's got us to where we are today. Uh, and you don't have to look far to see there are plenty of problems out there for which we need creative solutions. Um, I think the other side, which I, I, I do love, and you can see some evidence behind me, um, creativity creates wonderful artifacts, music and writing and theater and dance. And that obviously is a part of being a, a fulfilled human being. And uh, I think that's the other side. Um, as an individual, it, it gives me a pleasure. Uh, we know from the neuroscience, it's giving me some nice happy chemicals to reinforce that, but it's also, at a shared level, a wonderful thing to do to create something in a social space for its pleasure, as well as sometimes solving some rather urgent problems. So yeah, creativity, pretty big in my life and I suspect in everybody's. <laughs> wow. I, I wanted to ask you about uh, those instruments in the background later on, but since you mentioned them, um, something I'm wondering about creativity is that like on one, one hand side, we have those problems, those big ones that we deal with let's name it climate change diversity all the all the things that we um, now try to solve as humanity um, but then uh, there is also this playful creativity that allows to make music to play music to make puns and I wonder uh, how do you see those two interacting in a way because for me sometimes you know I'm a productivity freak and then uh, when I think of okay I will just go and play instruments and or do something silly it feels like a waste of, of potential, but I wonder, <laughs> do, can I somehow explain to myself why I'm playing? Yeah. Uh, yes. And, and indeed, you can justify the playtime. You, know, you can actually allow yourself because it's quite important. Um, yes, there's, there's plenty of theory. Uh, I mean, creativity actually isn't that cartoon moment. Bing, the light bulb, that's creative. It isn't like that. It's been studied extensively and uh, it's a process. It starts with recognizing there's something we want to get a solution to. It may be a problem. It may be we're trying to create a work of art or a piece of music. There's a start, but we don't necessarily find the solution instantly. I mean, sometimes we do. It's like a supermarket. Oh, there's an obvious answer. Take it off the shelf. There we go. But very often, and this goes back to this evolution, we've got this ability to search. And that searching doesn't take place in linear fashion. It's very much about interesting branching pathways in the brain, making odd connections. If you think about your dreams, um, dreams go in very weird places. I won't ask you to go into detail about your dreams, but <laughs> dreams go in strange places. But what's going on there is your brain is associating in a very free form fashion. Um, but that association is really important. So actually sometimes playing a piece of music or going for a walk or doing some crazy dancing, anything that turns you on, isn't just fun in itself and possibly creative. It's also a 
stepping stone to somewhere you might need to get to in that productivity challenge. So the kind of playful creativity is a key part of the whole thing. And I think the evidence is that um, we've evolved, our brains have evolved to reward those kinds of playing behaviors. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of learning. It's a way of learning, finding things out, experimenting, which is going to be essential for survival. So play is pretty important in creativity. Mm, so, so in a way, uh, I recall also some research generally about uh, things that we fear and things that we find pleasure in, like they are sometimes um, connected strongly to our survival. So we could say also, also having fun is in the very same way. Um, we will be switching shortly to more and more serious topics <laughs> in terms of creativity uh, <laughs> as much as we can, obviously. Um, but also, I would like to invite our viewers, if you will have any questions on the way, keep asking them and uh, closer to the end, we will be answering everything that you are curious about in terms of creativity, either because you joined and wanted to hear from, from us or either because you will get inspired about what we talk on. And moving, moving uh, further, I want to uh, tackle the business context. So. Um, I found a very interesting piece by Beite and Farnham. Um, they did a review of research in terms of creativity, and they found out that in many ways, what we have as a given in business is in contradiction to what allows creativity. And just to name a few is that risk-taking is one of the factors that support creativity, while in business, it's not always the case that we will we will risk much. And then... Um, the same goes for um, the boundaries. Uh, sometimes when we have when we are too strict with what we can do, this also can restrict um, the the creative uh, output we have. And then um, ambiguity that we try to resolve always. We try to be certain. We try to be confident um, in a business. We try to have a strategy. While while when something is ambiguous, that's good for creativity because we can think about it in different way like you uh, John mentioned um, when we when we have this creative uh, fun time that actually brings some new and new um, inspiration so yeah I'm wondering how is creativity connected to business in in how it supports it how it um, destroys it what can we do about it to make sure that uh, we keep on being creative in, in business because that's how we solve problems. We already set that in stone. So yeah. what's your take? So uh, another little question, huge. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me break that into two parts. The first mm -hmm. part, what I'm reading on the screen, where is creativity needed? Everywhere. I mean, just as human beings, we have to be creative to survive. Any organization has to innovate to survive. It has to come up with ideas and deploy them to survive. And that's as true for the public sector as it is the private, and it's certainly true in the not-for-profit world as much as the profit. And we'll come back to it, I'm sure, but a lot of my current research is around the humanitarian yeah. sector. So people like Save the Children or the Red Cross, they're in situations, disasters, natural or man-made, they need to find solutions. And very often the mainstream the things you'd normally do, the sort of supermarket or take that off the shelf and do it, you can't do it. You have to create to come up with something new. But everywhere you look, we need creativity. So that, let's take that as a given. Then the second part of your question is the context. And of course, you're right. The assumed context of business is we want to do something and control it so we can do it again and again and again. And if we allow variation, it's just to do it a little bit better. We have a, a sort of bias towards that, not surprisingly. That, of course, is difficult for creativity because, as you suggested, it tends to sort of constrain the space in which we can do it. Um, but I think the smarter organizations know that. They do know that we need to allow some space. Um, it doesn't have to be giving people a week off to go and do crazy things up a mountainside. Uh, if you take a company, one of my um, companies I, I, I've been impressed with for a long time, Toyota. Now, Toyota may not make the most dramatic cars in the world, though their Prius was quite game changing, but they are, however, and have been for the last 50 years, the most productive car maker. 
and productivity matters in that business world, uh, that comes not from just doing one or two things. It comes from a steady stream of creativity. And they tap everybody's creativity. When you sign up to work in Toyota, you sign up not just to be a pair of hands, but to bring your brain, to actually contribute. And their, their theme is very much what they call Kaizen, little improvements from everyone, little pieces of creativity. And in order to make that happen, they allow a small amount of time every day in their production schedule. So if you visit a Toyota plant anywhere in the world, they'll take typically 15 minutes before they start working to do some thinking. And the thinking is controlled creativity. So theirs is high frequency every day, but relatively little. That's different from Google who say, yeah, we think our engineers need 20% of time to play. And things like Google Mail, Gmail came as a result of one of those play projects. So it makes a difference. Whether it's 20% or 15 minutes, doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. It's the sense of giving an appropriate amount of space and with it, the permission. And I think your point about the Furnham article, it's very much, does the company want this? Well, frankly, any company that doesn't want it is probably stupid and probably not going to survive very long. So we need creativity, but we also need to construct the context in which it can happen. Wow, that's a, that's already a, a very pragmatic outcome I'm taking for um, starting the day with uh, with some thinking. How can I make things better? How could we make things better? What maybe um, upsets me in my day to day work, and and how could we fix that? That's a, that's a brilliant case, and it reminds me uh, in the book of Tim Ferriss I was reading recently about a practice just for the muscle of creativity which is to write a list every day to put a problem uh, in front of yourself it can be something that you're dealing with or something absurd it doesn't matter like how to make sure my house is always clean even though i don't want to clean and then you you start brainstorming you start uh, writing down the ideas just to um, keep the um, creative juices flowing keep the keep being uh, keep using this part of your um, of your imagination, but yeah, why not to put it into something concrete? And I'm, I'm wondering about this, and still keeping the topic of uh, business and creativity, because for me, actually, to to be frank, like as a trainer that sometimes deliver creativity sessions, they were always um, brought up around some bigger topic, like for instance, uh, when the autonomous vehicles were introduced, we were doing some workshops. Um, in one of the manufacturers, how the interior will look like, what what changes will be there when you don't have to drive a car, how could it uh, how could it be designed? So you know a big problem that uh, that can bring a lot of a lot of solutions or naming workshops when you figure out okay I have a new product I have a new brand how to name it properly. So, so but but from what what I'm hearing from you is that it's maybe even more important to um, tackle this everyday creativity um how how would you you know how would you if you if you had to choose as a, as a business owner which to focus on more which to develop on more these little changes or these big ones that um that can twist the entire organization it's it, it, it's a, a simple one to answer um, we need both but let, let me just elaborate a little if you imagine a spectrum OK, At one end of the spectrum is doing what we do a little bit better. That's what we call incremental innovation. And that really is important. That's what Toyota specialized in. There wasn't one magic thing that made them the world's most productive car maker. It was little, 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 little building over decades, millions of ideas every year, which they mostly implement. So one end of the spectrum is that. The other end at the extreme is doing something we've never done before, something wacky, completely different, radical. And we need that because from time to time we need a jump. And go back, if I can, to Toyota. The Prius was not an incremental improvement on Henry Ford's car. It was a radically different concept, this, this hybrid engine. Um, and it has changed the world. It set the, the pattern for the beginnings of electromobility. But we need everything in between. Two things about it. If you take the low end, it's very safe 
this is not high risk because it's mostly doing what we know a lot about a little better. It's the shop floor worker or the woman in the call center who already does a job, but thinks, I think I could improve this. We could improve the customer service or we could cut that time down a little. Those things matter and they accumulate. And that's perhaps the key message. The small things add up. I could bore you with some statistics if you really want, but we know from studies of countless innovations, most innovation, most of the time is incremental. It's that doing mm -hmm. what we do better and its impact is cumulative. Occasionally the radical change comes, but even when it does, you need a lot of the smaller stuff to make it work. If you have a radical idea for a new car engine or a new service concept and so on, it doesn't just magically happen. You need a lot of small creativity to make it happen. So we've got this spectrum. Um, the risk goes up, the challenge goes up, but we can do it. We need both. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the other thing for me, which is in a lot of my work in organizations, everybody is creative. And that's perhaps something a myth we'll come back to. But you know, th this notion that there are somehow special people with a big C on their chests. I am creative. It's not like that. Everyone's creative. Look at any bunch of kids in a playground if you want reminders. We may not choose to deploy our creativity in always the same dramatic fashion. But basically, everyone can find a space along that spectrum. And so if we're serious about using creativity in our organizations, a big question we have to ask, particularly as senior leaders, is are we managing, are we working to draw that creativity from our employees? Wow, wow. This this already connects to the next research I wanted to um, tap into. And something that actually, when I was writing um, a summary, a review of uh, research and creativity, this one literally blew my mind. Um, because in in pop culture what we what we tend to do is to tell 10 things that steve jobs did that make him made him creative or think like einstein was what was the way that he was inventing so so uh, so many amazing things but um kaufman and baghetto baghetto um what they did in their research they try to differentiate between what you what you call the spectrum so the things that are the little everyday creativity and the overwhelming, life-changing, world-changing creativity that uh, totally disrupts um, what we know in in the given field, in or or in general, maybe even. Um, so I wonder if we could maybe tap into this a little bit even more. So for the small everyday creativity, what is needed? How we can embrace it? How we can improve it? And then later on, second for the big C. So if, if we are all creative, how we can spark that for um, for this dramatic changes for, for that that make make a difference. But starting with the small C, how do you think um, this everyday innovation can be embraced? Okay. Well, I mean, it's a great question and, and, and really big territory again, but I think a very important question for organizations is how do we get everybody to contribute in their own way and particularly in their comfortable way because they're giving ideas, they don't have to, so they've got to feel safe to do it. But how do we help them with that? Um, the good news is it's natural. If you take those people away from work, they do it in their family life, in their social life. And you know, people are not just what they are at work. And when you study them, when you look at them in other contexts, they can be very creative. So I come back, I, I'm, I'm absolutely sort of convinced this is my one article of faith. People are creative, but they can be more creative. And you used a nice metaphor earlier on. You talked about the creativity muscle. And um, in, in our book, and uh, I'll give a plug for our book, but we wrote a book around creativity in organizations. Uh, but we had the idea of the, the creativity gym. Now you go to the gym to work out and develop and so on. And what you're really doing is you're fit or you think you're fit, but you want to get fitter. And it may be you want to develop just I want to be fit or you may say, I really want upper arm strength or I really want strength in my legs. And, so and what you have in a gym is essentially resources to help. You have equipment specialized as well as general. You might have a personal trainer, a coach. 
uh, you have all sorts of other things, but you've got to put in the work. So it does come down in the end to you. But the good news about creativity is there's plenty of those tools, techniques, the, the equivalent of the gym equipment and the workouts and so on to help do that. If I take a, a specific example, then mm -hmm. we, we, we talk about the small C. Everybody can do it, but how? And one of the big questions is, well, where do I start and who's going to listen to me? And one thing we're seeing a great deal more of is the the idea, which certainly wasn't Toyota's idea, but the idea of the, the suggestion box back in the 19th century and even before that. I've got an idea. I'll post it in the box and hope something happens. That's not really going to lead to much change. What we now have is the way of engaging lots of people, many thousands sometimes in an organization, in contributing their ideas and helping make them work. And they're typically called collaboration platforms or innovation platforms. What they do is provide a structure. It's like going to the gym. They allow people um, to work on a machine. They try out, they learn how to do a creative thing. They take their idea from their heads, post it, elaborate it, develop it, and possibly implement it. Oh, that was good. I'll try again. So they're developing their muscles. And the evidence from this kind of collaboration platform is pretty compelling. You have organizations, um, Liberty Global is the world's biggest cable company. Um, and they have brands like Virgin Media and so on, certainly in the UK. Um, they've got tens of thousands of employees, many of whom work in call centers or work in uh, fixing the cable in the engineering in somebody's household. So these are, inverted commas, ordinary jobs, not radical creativity jobs. And what Liberty Global have done is to say, let's share our ideas. And they're getting savings worth millions of euros year on year from thousands of employees. And this is a regular process, not because they've said, please, we want you to be creative. They put in place the enabling structure. It's like a kind of company gym where people can do it. Um, there are lots of simple hacks and there are formal training techniques, but people can learn to be creative. Everyone is creative, but they can all, we can all learn to be more creative in all sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. so, so if I wanted to put it into a process, that would be um, first they just post the ideas. So it's not that much demanding, but then they also have the framework to develop them, right? So it's, uh, it's more than creativity, it's the full innovation process that allows the employees to contribute to how the innovation is dealt with in, in their in their business. Yeah, so in those platforms, they're called innovation platforms. That's exactly it. And and the idea is very much, um, or the, 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 the smart way to use them is not simply to say, um, just drop an idea in, but giving a target. What, matter, what matters to the organization? We want to improve customer service by 30%. We want to cut quality problems by 5%. Whatever the strategic target is, it becomes what's called a campaign. That's what we're all going to work towards and we need all the creativity we can get. So there is a focus and there's some sense of updating that we are making progress. There's, some, you know, there's a lot of leadership involved in this to, to keep the motivation to create. But yes, it's an enabling process. It very importantly is a process which is not just about individuals. It's very much, you might post an idea, but think Facebook kind of world. Other people can say, hey, Radek, that's a cool idea. I like that. And, and they put their idea and someone else chips in there. So you collectively creating and these people don't even have to be in the same country. They can be spread across a global organization. So this kind of tool, I think, has accelerated the, the possibilities of the small C becoming widespread. Um, and, and, and back to what we started with, I think the small C is really important because everyone can do it. So there's, mm -hmm. there's the possibility of high involvement, high volume creativity. But it's not to say that the big C isn't also important. Yeah, and exactly switching to it. And and my biggest concern was when I was when I read the paper of Kaufman uh, the first time was that we praise um, Leonardo da Vinci, we praise uh, Bill Gates, we we praise all the people that achieved a great success and brought some innovation into into the world, 
Um, but the authors claim that there is so many factors that affect it that you cannot really figure out what is the true process of Big C creativity. So if Da Vinci didn't live in the times of great support from uh, from the patrons uh, to art, we wouldn't see his uh, his arts, especially because he was so um, not not really <laughs> timely and not really finishing what he starts. Um, and and same goes for every every single one of um, one of the things that are now the the thing the the things that we discussed that were greatly impl Im impacting the world. So I wonder if this is such an unpredictable um field creating um world changing innovation or business changing innovation if we want to uh, speak a little bit smaller how can we control that how can we manage that in in any way how can we you know spark it in our organizations another great question okay so Let's move along our spectrum to the, the extreme end, the, the radical, the big stuff. And can I then puncture another myth, which is innovation, that, that creativity deployed into something that changes the world. Um, it's very, very, very rarely a solo act. So, and you, you, you beautifully described it, even Leonardo da Vinci, one of the, the wonderful people, um, still needed a lot of support. Um, but there's also something people like that who may be very radically creative and there's some research that suggests the line between that and what we would label a kind of madness is quite a thin one so there's very interesting sort of neurological things going on but those kinds of people are exceptions outside the norm okay and very often outside of companies, outside of the world of business. Um, there's a lovely book I'd recommend to, to, um, by Melissa Schilling. Uh, the book's called Quirky. Uh, in English, we have this word quirky, which means kind of odd. But, mm. And she's making, she makes a study of some quirky people. Um, Nikolai Tesla, for example, who, apart from giving his name to a, a kind of car, uh, was a genius, incredibly bright, but slightly crazy. I mean, he came up with some amazing ideas and some really stupid ideas. He was very um, compulsive. He would uh, he disliked the number six, so he wouldn't go anywhere near a number six. He um, retreated into his room. It's a wonderful example of the kind of extreme creativity, which we kind of associate in the world of art. You know, think Van Gogh or someone like that. We kind of, we get that the line between creativity and, you know, um, dysfunctional um, mental behavior uh, is very thin. So put those people to one side. Let's stay with the world of business, the world of organizations trying to achieve something. Um, we probably don't want, we probably couldn't handle those kinds of people, but in any case, they're very much at the very edge. What we are interested in is the kind of group, the team, the, the, the collection of people who can achieve something radical. And the great news is there's plenty of examples. We take the COVID-19 crisis now. I mean, that was a great example of crisis demanding innovation, you know, life and death. When we started, we didn't know what this virus was and we needed protective equipment. We need ventilators so people could breathe. We needed vaccines. You know, this is serious stuff for which we need mega creativity. The great thing is teams formed not just inside organizations. This was an example where the challenge was so big, they cooperated across, but it was the team. And the team is really important. And we've known about this for a very long time. Um, uh, another book I would recommend amongst a long reading list, but uh, uh, is the book called Skunk Works. And we hear the word skunk works very often in the context of creativity and innovation. It has a very specific meaning and a specific history. Back in the Second World War, um, things were getting tight in the early 1940s, and particularly the Americans who just joined the war realized with the British and the other allies, there was a serious problem in the sky because the Germans had a flying jet fighter, faster than anything else, jet powered, and nothing else that the allies had could come near it that was all propeller driven. So there's a really urgent challenge. We have to have 
a jet fighter to combat this. Otherwise, we're in deep trouble. So there's the challenge. It was given to the Lockheed Company uh, in California. We need a jet fighter and you've got six months to do it. OK, that's pretty challenging. And the way it was done, they basically set up a team, a special team, handpicked under the leadership. And this was a very special kind of leadership of a man called Kelly Johnson. <clears throat> and they couldn't even find anywhere, any space to work. So they rented a circus tent. So an old circus tent, which still smelled of elephants and things. And on the other side of the airfield, they started trying to solve this almost impossible challenge. Um, one of the parts of the challenge was they didn't even have an engine to play with. The only jet engine in the world that they could use was in Britain, and it would take two months to travel by sea to get to California. OK, so some serious challenges. The great thing is they succeeded. They succeeded within the six months and the plane flew first time. They eventually became the trainer that all the forces after the war used to transfer from propellers to jet planes. Now, that wasn't an accident. That was Lockheed understanding. That was a particular way of organizing for a team that gave them a lot of freedom, gave them a lot of space, gave them very clear leadership of a very special kind. Quite supportive, quite challenging, but that sense of never mind the rules, I'll keep you safe, you know, as long as we do. So lots going on in there. And of course, Lockheed said this worked. And one of the things about that team in Burbank was they'd given themselves a name. It was after a cartoon character, but they called themselves the Skunk Works. This is the place where people didn't want to get too close because it smelt badly and so on. But the Skunk Works name stuck. It's now trademarked by Lockheed because it's the place where they have developed many really radical innovations. All the stealth technology. I mean, if you think about stealth aeroplanes, that's physically impossible in the laws of physics. You want something that's invisible to radar, but you can't put a piece of metal in the sky and not expect waves to bounce off it. How do you make an invisible aeroplane? That's a skunk works challenge. And so all of that technology came from that. So long stories, but we, can, we know a lot about big C and when we need it, we can make the teams. They need to be often specialized. And this may be where you need specialized skills to come together. I would stress very strongly it's a team effort. I would really be surprised to find any solo genius in that kind of context who could do it all. Um, and therefore, you're bringing in questions like, how does the group trust each other? How do they work together? How do you lead them? How do you make sure you don't give them too much space so they all fall asleep? Because it's such an easy life. So these are challenges. But I think the good news is, just as we know how to make the small C work, we can construct structures and develop support mechanisms to enable the big C. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm soaking in all this. It's uh, a lot of nice examples. And so if, if I was to sum it up in some, in some practical advice, it seems like the most important thing is focus around safety and around like when, when you said about about Tesla and, and all his um, projects that were great, but also those that maybe weren't that good, we don't hear much about them because the great ones uh, were uh, more of a public mm. phenomenon. So in a way, it's risk taking, but also like you, you mentioned from Lockheed is this possibility to have space for errors, to to be safe because your leader is protecting you um, and, and is offering you this opportunity that you can um, play and fail. I wonder, would you add something to this, to to this summary? Yes, I mean, I, I, I think the very good news about this whole theme of creativity is we have done a lot of research and we know a lot about it. Uh, not just from the sort of psychological, neuropsychological stuff, but actually how to make things happen in practice, how to develop these skills. I think that the individual skills are important, no question, and they're things we can work on as individuals. But where it really matters in organization is at that team level. And I think the evidence is there are four things that really are important. So the first one is vision, the sound of stretching target. Um, and that, of course, avoids the, the, the Tesla effect of doing something which is just wild and wacky just because it's interesting. 
Yeah. So a clear, focused target. This is what we're going to get. But a stretching target, not something that's easy to do. Stretching. We really want to do this. Um, and that's really important. So that's the first one. The second is that concept you just alluded to. If you're going to get somewhere stretching, you're going to have to take risks and you're going to have to try stuff out that maybe doesn't work. And, and the, the, the term that describes that kind of context is psychological safety. And it's really an important space because we need to feel safe if we're going to, amongst a team of other people, volunteer our ideas. At the limit, we don't want to lose our job, obviously, but we need to feel safe to take risks and to fail. We need to look stupid and not worry that our colleagues are going to say we're stupid because sometimes being stupid gets you somewhere you wouldn't otherwise have got to. So this notion of psychological safety becomes really important. For me, I, I have a lovely kind of memory. I, I spent a year when I didn't want to be the engineer I became. Um, I spent a year when I left college uh, in a theatre group. So we were touring the country, playing music and performing. Great fun. Um, probably not the best way to earn a living, but great fun. And also I learned a lot about creativity in that context. And one of the things actors and musicians, they do a lot of uh, training. And so in their kind of muscle building, one of the exercises they do is a very simple one. You see the team, the rest of the team, the other end of the room, they're 30 meters away and they're standing there. And you run and you get faster and faster and then you leap into the sky hoping they're going to catch you. Now, if you think about that, as you leap into the sky, you have taken the biggest risk because if, if, if they don't catch you, crash, it's going to hurt. Of course, what it's trying to do is to build that sense of you can trust them. And everybody has a go. So everyone at the end of the session says, I trust these people. Whatever happens to us on stage in front of an audience, we'll get through. And we may have to make it up, but psychological safety really powerful concept and important to bring into place. And I think that's a key to some of the successful creative teams for the Big C project. Two other things which perhaps we can bring in. Um, you've got to support people. You've got to build on what they say. The whole thing about creativity, it's not mm -hmm. the perfect idea. It's often a lot of different things that come together to create something. Um, Again, back to the theatre, but it's perhaps a good reference point. Uh, if you ever watch improvisation, and there's lots of TV programs now where you can see it, yeah. it's great. But the one principle of improvisation is whatever somebody gives you, you don't say, oh, I don't know how to deal with that thing. You say, yes, and. So, Ruddick, you might say, John, uh, your grandmother's just turned up in a spaceship from Mars, and she's got this important thing for you. And I don't say, Ruddick, are you crazy? What are you? I say, Yes, and what she brought me was this piece of moon rock. And, you, know, you have to hand it on, you have to work with it. That depends on everyone in the team supporting and building. And almost certainly your, you and your audience have heard of brainstorming, and that has its origins in a very special, specific place. It came out of the advertising industry, trying to get more creative ideas to sell products. Um, and the idea was fairly simple. Don't judge an idea too early, postpone judgment. That's pretty good. The trouble is that it's these days often don't criticize. Don't judge. Any idea goes, paper the wall with post-its, it's all okay. No, the evidence for that is very clear. That supporting climate is very good, but my fourth factor is we need creative conflict. We need creative criticism. We have to challenge ideas, otherwise they're never going to be good ones. They're just going to be any idea goes. So what, again, high performing teams work on is a culture which is safe enough that you can challenge, but also productive enough that at the end of it, having built on ideas, there is something. Um, again, a, a, a great reference point and a, another lovely book is um, the one written by Ed Catmull. And Ed Catmull was the, for many years, involved in Pixar the movie company. And Pixar, if you think about making a movie as innovative as Toy Story was for its time, and then continuing to repeat that trick, there's a lot of creativity going on. But his book is full of the reflections of how they do things. And it's all about building this climate of creative conflict. Every day they challenge what they did before, knock it, and what survives this 
robust challenge is going to be strong and a great idea. And the important part, the psychological safety part is people don't feel I'm attacked. Oh, stop hitting me, Ruddick. It's OK, Ruddick. You don't like that idea. Well, how about if we did this? How about so it changes the dynamics. So those are four factors which we can train. And in training that, we can build really high performing big C creative teams. All right. And, and actually, you mentioned something I wanted to build up on. Um, another research by Furnham um, about brainstorming and, and this, this very classical approach to brainstorming, the popcorn one, when we gather people in the room and they have to shout out the ideas. So, um, so Furnham was criticizing this approach. Like, first off, he mentioned um, a very old study from 1880, I think, um, that was mentioning people rope pulling that they um put less effort if mm. the more people are pulling so the, the more we are the less we are individually involved and, and same goes for such a big group brainstorming that was one the second one was this fear of judgment but even if you know i believe it's still true even if we create a meeting and we say okay don't judge the ideas people can still fear of judgment. So they still could hesitate to share their idea when when it's, uh, when it's they perceive it to be stupid, especially when we didn't build this psychological safety first. And, and lastly, um, he mentioned also something that is also quite obvious that when you have, let's say 20 people in the room and you only one is speaking at the time, you are wasting the time of the 19 other that could do something in the very same same time. So there are some tweaks into that, but generally I wanted to introduce this um, topic of facts and myths uh, about creativity that you already mentioned that could give us maybe some concrete guidelines on how to how to think about it. So so one is don't bring people in the room and, and ask them to <laughs> shout out ideas. But I wonder from your um, practice and from, from your, your research, what are the other common myths and, and some facts that we should know about um, about creativity. Okay, um, well, yeah, I think there are plenty of them. And I think that's part of the problem with creativity that we, we often are working with uh, um, incomplete ideas, mythological ideas sometimes about it. Um, so let, let's just knock a few down. We've talked about several of them. Everybody's creative. This idea of the, the perfect person who is super person creative. No, there's this spectrum. What the psychological evidence says is that we have different styles. We prefer to be creative in different ways. So at the extreme, the place where the Teslas of the world are, it's a fairly uncomfortable place, but that's okay. For most of us, it's probably somewhere in the middle of our spectrum. So, so but everyone is creative, that's clear. Um, and the second thing is creativity isn't somehow a fixed quantity we can develop the skill. So we touched on those and I'd certainly come back to it. I think the um, the big and small C is also a, a question we've touched on. Please remember the spectrum because there's plenty of room for us to be creative along the spectrum. It's not just about the big stuff. It's also not just about the small stuff it's managing. If I take the one you've just touched on though, brainstorming is a great example. If you go back to the original work by a man called Alex Osborne, 1957, the advertising executive, this was a nice and a useful tool at the time. He didn't say every idea is great. They hadn't invented post-its then, but if they had, they would have picked. No, no. What he said was very clear. Postpone judgment. In other words, in the very early stage, we want to remember the improvisation. Yes, and listen to someone's idea, hear it, and at least allow it to take existence. Postpone the judgment until we as, as a team have come up with it and then say, now let's just take these ideas that are up there and challenge them. So we're not, not judging, we're postponing judgment. And that's a very subtle thing, which so often, you're absolutely right, has got missed. So, so many organizations, let's brainstorm this. And they don't mean anything more than let's just talk, let's shout, let's not listen, let's paper the wall with post-its. Lots of ways to get nothing done. So very important that we are much more precise and we use some of the knowledge. Uh, we know, for example, and it's a fairly obvious one, if your boss is in the same room as you are, you're probably not going to be uninhibited in the things you suggest. 
happiness. So there's something about having a, a process facilitator that that manages to, if your boss has to be in the room, then make sure he or she doesn't dominate things and bringing up. Um, if you have someone who talks all the time, turn them down. If somebody doesn't talk, turn them up. You know, this idea of facilitating a session, um, nominal groups are really rather powerful. What you've alluded to, um, you don't always have to be all together, and that's perhaps one of the strengths of the virtual world. You can still share your ideas if you post them in different ways, if you first of all write them down and then share lots of different mm -hmm. tools. So in other words, brainstorming is actually a toolbox used well. You can build some great creativity. Used badly and you just smash the place up. Nothing happens. So I think for me, there, there, there's a lot of myths around the way in which creativity can be deployed. And they're dangerous because what tends to happen is organizations say, ah, oh, creativity, that's just the playground. The real job is, but if we go back to how we started this conversation, every organization does need creativity. Um, I have a, we have in, 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 in near where I live, uh, the uh, big government office called the meteorological, meteorological office. And this is where all the weather forecasting is done. And if you think weather is actually big business these days, you know, because if you want to plan an event, you need weather information. If you're a farmer, you need weather information. Um, it's still technically part of the military in Britain, because you know, if you're a general or a, a, an admiral, you need to know about the weather. Weather matters. So we have a thousand people in a dedicated center who are trying to do the job of weather forecasting and improve particularly the services they can offer. So it's a kind of innovation business as well. Okay, how do they do it? Well, creativity, there's gotta be a scope for that. What was interesting is how much that organization has transformed over the 10 years or so I've been looking at it. From one in which there were a very small number of bottom-up people who convinced the chief executive they'd like a space. So this is quite a nice modern building and it has a lot of glass walls. One of the rooms was the creativity room. And at the time, it was the space where it didn't look the same as other offices. There were no desks. There were a few comfortable seats. There were some wall charts. There were posters and so on. Uh, that looks a bit odd. And most people in the organization thought, that's where the crazies are and so on. That's the playground, the kindergarten. But gradually, those people were drawn in. And very importantly, what happened in that room was not playtime. If it had just been what you've described, the post-its, the talking, and everyone has an hour off work while they have some fun and so on, and then they go back to work. Now, what began to happen was as people were drawn in, they realized this is a space where we can pause. We have some space to think. We've got some different challenges, perhaps different people, different perspectives, many of the things that make a good session. And they went back with new ideas, new projects, and they told their friends and more. If you go there today, they can't get in the room. The room is fully booked. They've had to expand to provide extra space because the space that they are allocated for being creative is now becoming so important to the organization, they need a lot of it. So in, in essence, what they've learned is to move away from the myths and the, the, the elements that appear almost childish and don't belong in a real organization they've made it part of the organization and it pays for itself. It justifies in terms of the new products and services they're able to introduce that have come through this. It, it's it, it's um, um, something, something new, new that, that came, came to my, to my, mind, my right mind right now. now. And by the way, I hear myself, there is something in, oh, no, now it works. All right. So um, something I um, that came to my mind right now is that like I was thinking when, when seeing all those big corporate organizing these rooms for creativity, for playfulness, and that that's lovely, but it seems like redundant in a way. I mean, so so now you can't be creative if you don't have a, a slide in your office. You can't be creative if you don't, ha don't have those nice comfy uh, sitting bags in your office. Mm. Um, and, and I wonder like, it, it, it seems it matters actually, right? From, from what I'm hearing from you, it matters. Mm -hmm. It should be some sort of uh, creative place, uh, fun place. And I wonder if we can design it, you know, if we don't have a budget to 
create a separate room with slides and and all those colorful fun uh, fun tools to play. You know what? How can we spark this uh, fun during a creative session um, in a budget? Let's say. Yeah, I mean, I, I, let's be clear. What's going on in that example I gave was symbolic. Its power was its symbolism. It became, hey, we've got to think about this creativity thing and let's go through the door and find out what's going on and learn. Um, there's a real risk at the moment that organizations think all you need to be creative is to have such a room. So they open the room, they put all the fun stuff in there, and that's it. We don't have to do anything more. That's totally wrong. What we're looking for are spaces within which innovation, creativity can happen, uh, particularly that thinking. And what we know about it is there's spaces where we can think differently, spaces where there isn't the same pressure we have to produce. And so there's a kind of time bubble there. Uh, spaces where it's okay to challenge, you know, break the taboos of the organization, challenge it. You know, these are spaces, they are places where there's permission to think differently. Mm. So they it's don't... more, yeah, so it's more about the rules than about the physical environment, right? Absolutely. It's, it's um, uh, for me, it, 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 it's, it, it, it's the, the, the permission, the structure, the enabling space that does not have to be that physical fun room but that can sometimes help, um, particularly in an organization. This was, as I mentioned, a government department. It's a challenge to the rather bureaucratic civil service mentality that might have been in the old world. Mm. But it doesn't have to be. Um, Toyota do this by the side of the, the factory floor. In the humanitarian sector, when this happens, this may be out in the field. This, this can happen. I think we've learned a lot about things that can enable this at a physical level. So it's about the giving the permission, the space, enabling tools. But there are also some practical things. So much of creativity is around playing, as we've discussed. And sometimes having a thing to play with helps us explore. Prototypes become really important in this space. And so the idea that we can say, I've been working on this and I've made a mock-up, Radek. What do you think? And you can get hold of this and play with it and feel it's so a prototype being able to play with prototypes in that kind of space and bring different stakeholders together is a key part of that process. So I think the notion of innovation, creative spaces is really important. The danger is they become playgrounds, just like the danger in brainstorming mm -hmm. is it becomes just a, a place to have a little sleep off work. So it's about managing a very serious, and creativity is serious because it's about survival. That doesn't mean it doesn't have to be, doesn't mean it can't be fun, can't be enabled in a different fashion. All right. Wow. That's uh, that's promising. I mean, it seems with some 100 euros or more, you can already uh, create such an, an enabling environment. That's, that's lovely. And I have one last question to ask you. Um, by the way, there was a question about all the books uh, you mentioned, so we will need to list them after this episode. Sure. Sure. <laughs> there was plenty. Um, but about the creative session, about the very nitty gritty details, um, when we when we try to organize one, I think there is plenty of information on the internet how to do it well. But what we might be missing is what can go wrong, what we should avoid, what we should um, pay attention to when we think about bringing people together in such a room and and creating that uh, that space. What are your experiences in that? Um... I guess we've covered a lot of it and it kind of take all the things we've talked about and reverse them. Um, if I were trying to design a guaranteed failed creativity session, um, do. no purpose. Let's just take people away for an hour and let's be creative. There's no focus. Um, it doesn't have to be as life threatening as the COVID one or as dramatic as the skunk works, but there's got to be a purpose. Uh, and we're asking people to commit their time. They're not stupid. They're not going to join in with something that's purposeless. So purpose. Um, get the process dynamics, the group process, all wrong. So have different levels of the hierarchy and loud people and quiet people and you know, that kind of thing. Um, I do remember one vivid session I was running for the military. It was a training program for senior military figures. Uh, and it took place in what was called a war room. And these are one of these high-tech environments where all the walls are blank and then you can project pictures of the enemy and 
Well, so it's really high tech, but the worst possible environment physically to try and get a bit of creativity going. So sometimes it's the physical space alone, but that can go the other way. So as, as we've discussed, if you just have a playground that feels like a kindergarten and it feels like there's no reason for being here, we're just hanging out and so on, that's not going to work. Um, no psychological safety. So people are allowed to bully other people. Oh, don't be stupid. That's a stupid. That's not going to help. Um, sometimes people having their own agenda. I've got the great idea and I'm going to insist on it. That's not going to. So taking many of the things we've talked about, putting it back together. Uh, I guess maybe the other thing I would challenge or not challenge, push back. What I'm reading on the screen, the way you formulated the question, what can go wrong in a creative session? That kind of implies that we're mostly doing stuff and then occasionally being creative. The real challenge is can we create the kind of organization where this is the norm? This is part of day to day working life. Um, I believe we can, but that takes it away from being episodic. It becomes part of the continuing thing. And two words you sometimes read in this area. We talk about the creative climate which is the kind of weather system that would support being creative. And we've touched on the things that matter. Safe structures, psychological safety, good leadership, time and space and so on. But like weather, it can change. And organizations may do this, particularly if they're working on a, an important big project. And then whew, that's done. Now let's get back to normal. The other word you hear a lot of is creative culture. And a culture for me is the way we do things around here, the pattern of behavior that describes how this organization works, that's long standing. And I believe creative cultures are what we're aiming for, which is where this is the way we do things around here every day. It's not a passing weather system. We are creative. And one of my many hero examples would be it's not perfect, but one of my hero examples would be 3M as a company. It's a product innovator, well over a hundred years, but from its earliest days, many of these principles about giving people space, trusting them, letting them fail and so on, it's in there. Not surprisingly, they've got hundreds of thousands of products out there. They This year is the celebration of sandpaper, their first product. It's now a hundred years old and I can still go down to the shop and buy it today. Coming up with that kind of great product regularly isn't an accident. I believe it comes from a creative culture. Okay, okay. just one last question, a case study. So mm, I would like to get my team to be more creative and I would like to start this regular stream of creativity. Would it work if I would set up some let's say creative Tuesdays when we have a dedicated time, like 20 minutes every Tuesday, because I, I feel the, the problem is that there should be some dedicated time and I cannot really do it every day. So mm -hmm. do you think if I said, um, okay, on Tuesdays, 9 a.m. to 9.20, please don't check your email, open our innovation box and share some of your thoughts on the given problem of the given week. Do you think would that help or because it's episodic still, it, it, it could harm in any way our regular creativity? How would you approach that? I don't have to, to give the context. I don't have time for every day, 20 minutes, but I want to spark this regular creativity among my team. Okay. I, I, I think it's great. I, I think two things I'd say. The first is why my point about purpose, unless People are naturally creative, but what we're talking really about is focusing that creativity towards a target. So why is it important for you and for them and for the organization? Otherwise, it doesn't matter how long you give it, there's no real edge to it. I think the second is um, episodic's fine if there's enough time and space to get something done. My instinct is that 20 minutes once a week, it may be a little too small, an hour a week certainly would make a message. And I've seen organizations do this. Um, so I think at that level, the Toyota model is repetitive, high frequency, little time. Um, but certainly focusing attention. It's also you um, as, as a sort of leader of an organization um, 
committing to the fact that's not money, that's not time that they will be doing productive job, inverted commas, productive things. That's a different kind of time. So it's it's signaling this is the space, uh, like Google's 20% and so on. This is signaling this is the space where we're going to try and think differently. And it's not going to happen in one session. It's repeated. So yes, repeated, I'd recommend an hour with a purpose. That would probably be a good start. Great. Great. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you very, you much, very much for your, for time. your time. I think I we will be closing the session. So um, yeah, once again, it, it was a pleasure. It was a lot of thoughts uh, I have noted and I will be listening again when it appears as a podcast. So thank yeah. you. Uh, my pleasure. It's been a really interesting conversation. I had no idea how much time had gone past because it's been such a pleasure. So uh, uh, hopefully we can carry on the conversation as well. But, but thank you. All right. I'm closing.